right. So folks, I'm just going to do a quick preamble while we get the while folks pour in after lunch here. And so for those of you that don't know me, I'm Angela Bedard Hahn. Um, I'll be presenting later in this session. I'll do a more of an intro of myself at that point. And so we're headed into the last uh, the last session of the, the Food Water Nexus workshop. And so I'm excited. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here for the whole thing. And I'm excited to see how this session goes and to and to hear about some of the outcomes of the of the meeting as a whole. And so we've got uh, seven speakers in the session. And so just a reminder that we want to try and keep your, your presentations as close to, to that five minute mark as possible, recognizing that we'll probably uh, creep a little here and there. And then we'll hopefully have time, uh, enough time for adequate questions and discussion at the end where we can try and look at some of the unifying themes and bring things all together. So really looking forward to that piece and we wanna make sure we don't give that uh, short shrift. So our first, uh, our first speaker today is Philip Harder. And so rather than me do an introduction, I think part of what everyone's being asked to do is to introduce themselves. And so I think we can uh, flash, turn it over to Philip to take it away. All right. Can everyone see? Not your slides yet. Were you sharing your screen? We see you, you look great. Great to see you. There we go. There's your screen. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Philip Harder. I'm a research associate uh, in, formerly in the Department of Geography and Planning. Uh, um, more formally, I guess, I'm in the Center for Hydrology in the Smart Water Systems Lab. I got my PhD in geography from USASC in 2018. Um, broadly, I'm interested in egg water interactions in cold climates. And my approach really is to look at sort of the physical process level, um, hydrological processes with emerging technologies to really understand the systems, um, and then to turn around and develop and apply models to forecast any changes. And so when I'm not studying egg and water, I like to participate in it. And so my cows have been the ones that have been getting me through uh, my socialization uh, hiatus. Um, where I work spatially to put you into context of where um, I, I'm doing my work. Um, so we have three main sites, Keniston, south of Saskatoon, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, and then the Livestock and Forage Center for Excellence is another cluster that we've got. And then up in Roster, north of the city um, is another area that I did a lot of PhD work, but all of these places still have some infrastructure and um, are part of our work. Uh, and they, they span a, a good gradient in soils and climate, um, even just around the city. Uh, what tools and methods I use, mostly in situ observations, so looking at micrometeorological observations to look at the energy balance. I'm also getting into soil moisture um, observations, so really di um, diving into the point scale, hot water and energy balances. Um, but then to scale it up, because points don't represent everything, um, I've done a lot of work with drone remote sensing. Um, and then to, to integrate these intensive campaigns of, of data collection, um, do a lot of work with hydrology and crop growth models uh, to, to tease out some of those relationships um, that we can't get at with um, just observations. Um, in the past, uh, my PhD was looking at snowmelt and stubble interactions. Um, we know that stubble will increase snow retention on the landscape, but what was missing was an understanding of how stubble might change the snowmelt processes and potentially meltwater partitioning. Uh, so getting at the lever, the stubble management lever in the egg water management. Uh, I've done a lot of work with micrometeorology over prairie wetlands, crops, and snow. Uh, done a lot of work with snow. Uh, and then yeah, more broadly using this drone remote sensing to look at topographic variability, snow depth, vegetation, and water quality at this unique scale that drones allow us to, to bridge from point to field, uh, for example. Currently looking at uh, observing and modeling crop growth and hydrology. Um, so we have lots of observations which we can synthesize down to water balances so we know where you know, rainfall or soil moisture is the source of, of water driving the growth. Um, and this changes obviously with space and time. Uh, and then looking at sort of dynamic crop growth modeling um, to integrate a lot of this, these parameters that we, that we need based on observations that we're collecting uh, to come up with new parameter sets, um, testing models to see 
see what we can use to simulate uh, crops and hydrology. Uh, the idea being that down the road, we can start looking at sort of climate change perturbations and see what kind of water future um, our prairies have in store for us. Um, but we know that not everything happens at a point where a lot of our modeling and point observations take place. And so this is where we get into a lot of the spatial variability work that I've been doing uh, with drones, um, looking at crop growth, water use, and, and soils. So we've got a bit of a fleet of drones with LIDAR, multi and hyperspectral systems, thermal, optical sensors. And, and with this toolkit, we can really um, understand the spatial variability uh, of many different dimensions of our landscape. Um, and we can combine that to come up with measurements of direct measurements of height, leaf area index, surface temperatures. We can combine this with energy balance map energy balance modeling to come up with spatially variable evapotranspiration maps. Uh, one new piece of kit that we just got that I'm quite excited about is a gamma ray spectrometer that we can mount on a drone, a passive sensor. And from this, um, there's some promise to look at soil characteristics, root zone and moisture, uh, and snow water equivalent over a field scale um, at a, in, within a, in a spatial context um, with, with actual observations. What would I like to see happen in and what I could contribute to sort of food and water um, is we need to improve the representations of agriculture in our hydrology models. Um, many of our hydrology models will assume that there is a crop and we, we know that a lentil versus a wheat versus a canola is all going to be behaving very differently. So we need to have better parameter sets that reflect the Canadian prairie context. Uh, because a lot of these parameter sets are coming from more temperate regions, um, which don't have winter. Uh, and the other, on the flip side, we need to have better representation of hydrology and crop models. Um, most crop models come from more temperate rate places. Uh, and so snow processes or winter processes are gen generally missing in action on these ones. Uh, so we need to couple those things in the context of the King Prairies a bit better. And I think there's an opportunity to really look at crop and water models uh, in terms of precision agriculture. Um, most prescription, many prescription techniques use NDVI, but in dryland farming with the crazy phenology variations that we have, um, that may not always be a, a very viable technique. And the question to leave you all with is, We've talked a lot about advances in crop breeding, um, less so about agronomy, but that will also be changing in the future. Um, but what's that gonna be like in the future? Uh, we can't understand ag climate hydrology impacts without knowing um, what, what agriculture will look like in the future. Historically, we can see from this plot here, Saskatchewan spring wheat yield has had this very nice increasing monotonic trend, even though water hasn't increased. Uh, we know what the future will hold somewhat in terms of our climate projections, um, but what's happening for the agriculture? Well, the crop that I'm going to be calibrating a model against today, does that exist in the future? Um, and is that a, a viable way of going about this? And so, yeah, that's who I am and, and kind of where I'm going. So. Excellent. Thanks very much, Philip. So you can't hear the deafening applause, but you know what's happening, right? So it's, <laughs> it's everywhere. The vibrations okay. are coming at you. Excellent. All right. So our next speaker is Kevin Schneider. And so Kevin, looking forward to hearing from you. Take it away. Okay, thank you. And uh, thanks for that last presentation. That was great. Uh, so I'm uh, Kevin Schneider. I'm a professor of computer science at, at USAS. I chose this picture just to show a little bit about me. I like to do outdoor activities. This is me on um, paddling with my wife, I guess, on Devil Lake, just north of Mississippi, Mississippi and north central Saskatchewan. And of course, I would never dare to go down that rapids, uh, even though it's probably not that, that much for some people. Um, who am I? I? I'm a researcher. I work in software and uh, human computer interaction and programming languages. I also have been a professional software developer and I've pioneered techniques to recover designs from legacy software. So doing things like source code mining to understand the code, uh, automating change. This is like looking for certain patterns and, and, 
and replacing with other patterns of code and using formal techniques. And also, um, if anyone's ever programmed graphical user interfaces, it can be quite a spaghetti code of connections between the, the interactive port parts and the uh, underlying model. And so looking at ways to tame that and usually using de declarative approaches for that. Uh, some of my research was uh, prior to coming to USAS, I came in 01, um, I was commercialized through a number of companies and I was president and CEO of one out of Kingston and we had an office in Barbados, which was great for staff retreats and such. And the picture I have here isn't Barbados, but it's uh, just Southern Saskatchewan. Um, it's in that Grasslands National Park and it, it's near where some of my family would have had a, a homestead. Um, so I grew up on the prairies, I had my undergrad here, but I typically moved away and came back, as I say, in 01. Uh, so what kind of tools do I use? So I, I use design notation. So drawing from programming language and compiler research, I will design, it's sort of like a secret sauce sometimes, is to develop a, a notation that has a clear semantics and we're able to express uh, task specific um, computation in a very flexible and limber and agile way. And so I will use these compiler techniques to do that and design notations for that. And some of the compiler techniques are also really good at improving performance of software. Uh, at a time, like maybe decades ago now, uh, compilers were one of the most complex software systems out there. And, um, and they, they went from multi-phase um, kind of processes to being able to be done just in memory and just in a blink of an eye. And so a lot of the tricks they've used there, um, I utilize for some other software that we're building. Also, I've been uh, building analytics throughout the software lifecycle, originally mostly looking at source code and studying it, but more and more we're looking at other software artifacts, whether they're bug reports or developer communication, and trying to see if we can get some insights and help predict um, code change, for example, or help developers to improve their productivity. And another way I've done that is by automating the process teams are using. So if you're it'd be similar to if you're conducting experiments and you have a certain process that you follow, whether it's curating the data or downloading the data, um, you know, making sure it's clean and be able to use, start running a process, making sure that each step is done appropriately. Um, I like to look at those processes and see if we cannot automate them by giving, you know, improving people's productivity and allowing them to track and control what they're doing. Um, as part of doing some of these, um, these uh, kind of techniques, I use version integration. So this is a way of looking as the models or parameters change from the different experiments is to looking at that change. And so I've developed some um, methods that allow me to do some fine grain uh, version integration. And I'm always intrigued by these new emerging advances in technology, whether they're when, when big data came out or we started looking at uh, deep learning algorithms or augmented reality or virtual reality and looking as they become a little bit more mainstream of what kind of architectures or designs can we use so that we can build that into our own software. So what I've done with in the food water nexus, I was um, part of the developing of the CFREFs and specifically in the uh, components with respect to the digital themes and helping to bring together some computer science researchers to be able to work on those um, projects. And also began uh, this notion of a digital research hub and starting to deploy um, things like Copernicus or Plato and, and bring in some Saskatchewan government money to help support some technical staff at the university to support uh, research software development. Um, on the food side, I was a, a co-PI of the PERC Cloud um, in the first phase of the project, which was developing a um, infrastructure to um, you know, host software services and to be able to deploy scientific and program scientific workflows. Um, this, of course, was done with many other people. And on the water side, I'm the USAS lead for the Global Water Futures Core Computer Science Project. And we've been mostly involved with renovating and accelerating hydrological modeling software, again, with many other, other people. 
Uh, so what am I doing now? Um, on the software side, I am very involved in software analytics research and working with Chancel Roy on things and Jody Mondell on things like the sensor create and a team of others across Canada um, to bring in a training program to help uh, train people with in, in software analytics. And the hope is also in partnership with the Global Institutes to be able to um, sort of have specific programs available for people who have a foot in, in different uh, in domains. Um, also, we're, we're putting forward a CFI, hopefully next year, which would build a software analytics lab. This would allow us to have the infrastructure in place to be able to take advantage of some of the the work that we're doing. On the food side, I'm working on the um, with Andy Sharp and Chantal Roy on the PERC data repository and uh, portal, as well as involved in the Bangladesh initiative, specifically in data management and analytics. On the water side, I continue to lead the Global Water Futures Core Computer Science um, project on, at the University of Saskatchewan. And um, that's involved with this ne next gen hydrological modeling, as well as a visualization platform. And the image I have here is just sort of a, an early prototype of some data management uh, uh, software that we're doing. So what would I like to see? So I would like us to sort of think about what role does software have to play, in particular research software, which I will not define, but um, how can we, will like, for example, I guess the question would be, does research software improve and accelerate our research? Um, and if so, they, like, does this give us this competitive advantage? And I guess I believe that it does and that it's important that we are kind of in control of research software um, for use in the, in the food water nexus. And so my hope would be that we could sort of strengthen the expertise we have in that area and the infrastructure so that we can build sustainable software. So this would be software that we see some very interesting prototypes and yet we need to do a little bit more work to make sure that they are maintainable, that they scale, they're useful and usable and not, not just maybe useful in just one simple, one particular context. Um, this needs to be done in a way that's researcher driven. We can't stifle innovation. We have to be, continue to build those prototypes but we do have to also start to think of how can we build that into sustainable software. And to me, this could be a multidisciplinary development, whether it's an open environment, um, you know, open source development, but it could also mean that we need some proprietary source development as well. And not just building everything here, but integrating tools that exist elsewhere. So a global perspective on how we can contribute to sustainable research software. Um, we need to, build an environment that embraces change so that we can build new features as we are trying out new ideas that we can easily put that into our software and make it available to our collaborators. And there's a numerous areas that I can see for where we can improve, where we can improve interoperability of the models or the computations that we're using. We can improve how we share our data, how we handle the data so that we can have maybe more flexible IO. Um, and trying to reduce the complexity of utilizing modern computing so that we don't have to understand all the parallel processing stuff out there. We can have ideas like serverless uh, computations, so we don't need to worry about the underlying infrastructure. Uh, so, oh yeah, sorry, I, just this picture, I should say. So to me, I, it's like yet another map with observation areas uh, sort of indicated on here. And so we do develop a number of maps and, and they're great, but it would be nice to start to for, for the community to have something that we can all contribute to and that is sustainable and maintained and reliable and available. Um, so a question for the group, this sort of comes under the, you know, um, what can I do for you kind of concept. And it's not just you tell me, but I think we need to, to work together to figure out what are these things. But how is research software limiting your research? So are you having challenges or problems with it? What are the pain points? And how can research software enhance your research? Where do you see where, you know, given what some of the people you've seen um, from computer science and other places are able to do, um, you know, can you automate some of your research pipelines that have yet to be automated or where can visual analytics or decision support 
um, better help you. And again, you know, how can we share or manage our data in a way that is useful for all? So that's me. Great, thanks very much. Over to Martin. Are you able to, yeah, I see him there. Martin, are you able to share your screen? I believe so. Let's see. Well, you're looking good, Martin. Well, that's the main thing, right? Can you see my screen? <laughs> Absolutely. And your screen looks really good too. Excellent. Yes. Okay. So I'm Martin. I'm going to give a little bit about me. Um, I did my um, graduate education in the 90s. Um, my master's thesis at the um, Broken River Ski Area, um, which is um, pictured there on the, on the left. It's in New Zealand. Um, it's an interesting place um, because um, um, you actually walk to it. You can, uh, you can drive almost you know, to the top of the vegetation here and then um, um, walk a little bit and then you know, get on some rope toes that take you up. There's a couple of rope toes that are operated by tractors that get you up the mountain. Um, you've got to wear a climbing harness and you know, um, flip this nutcracker thing over the, over the rope in order to, in order to get up. Um, I took a bunch of energy balance measurements there and snow measurements me there. That's uh, me taking some snow measurements um, with a with a thick section cutter, um, I um, was at the University of Colorado at the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences for several years, working on understanding climate and water resources over the Western U.S. Um, developing new streamflow forecasting methods. Here's a few snapshots of my work at that time. In the upper right is some analysis that I'd done with um, Filmote, um, published in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, um, looking at observed and modeled changes in snow water equivalent over the western US. Um, in the lower left, uh, some simulations of, um, of snow and the mountains in Colorado, um, emphasizing some of the work that we were doing on ensemble snow data assimilation. And the lower right is um, some earlier work that I did with Lauren Hay, and this was one of the um, first approaches where we were beginning to use um, medium range weather forecasts um, to predict stream flow. What I'm showing here is um, the time of the year on the x-axis and the forecast lead time on the y-axis. I'm showing the traditional approach and the ESP approach and, and our approach using model output statistics. Um, and the contoured plot is um, a probabilistic skill score. And um, this is shown for the Animus Basin in southwestern Colorado that we were able to um, 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 reduce the errors that we had in um, um, forecasts of snow melt um, um, during the spring. Um, in um, 2006 to 2010, I went back to New Zealand and um, went there to develop an operational streamflow forecasting system. Um, the figure on the right there is showing some of our work on streamflow data assimilation using different variants of the ensemble Kalman filter um, to um, um, to reduce errors in the streamflow simulations. And um, another research focus of mine um, was on understanding the spatial variability of snow. Um, so we had a field campaign um, where we were able to recruit um, um, people from universities to help us. Um, and we gave everybody a heli drop on, on the ridge top and um, volunteers were able to um, measure snow as they were um, making, making their way down to the valley floor. And we had to use the Halley ski runs because they provided a safe travel route um, from, from the ridge to the valley. Um, so that people didn't un encounter um, bluffs, you know, things like that. Um, in um, 2010 to 2018, I was at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in the US, um, focused on um, advances in continental domain hydrological modeling, uh, advances in ensemble streamflow forecasting methods, et cetera. Um, understanding the impacts of climate change on water resources is um, some snapshots um, for a couple of our papers that we're um, beginning to extend as we're, as we're working here in, in Canada. Um, the first is um, ensemble forcing, getting um, ensemble members of spatial meteorological fields that we use as input to our hydrological models um, so that we can characterize uncertainty. And then um, my version of, um, of um, the horrendogram um, to describe um, the construction of hydrological models um, using um, multi-physics, multi-scale hydrological models over, over large terrain. 
Um, now, um, well, for the last couple of years, I've been at the University of Saskatchewan, um, working on computational hydrology. Um, I've been building a team on computational hydrology and um, I'm co-lead uh, with Al Petronero of the GWF core modeling team um, focused on these areas. And um, now a lot of our work is, um, is focused on North America. Um, got some animations of our ensemble um, precipitation, our simulations of snow water equivalent, our simulations of, um, of stream flow and lake level that we're doing over, over larger continental domains. Um, a lot of our work, I've, I've, I've touched on some of this, some of it is focused on the spatially variable inputs to hydrological models, their ensemble forcing in the upper left. Um, we have a land model, um, um, SUMA, um, which has got flexibility in the way that we represent processes and flexibility in the way that we um, discretize the landscape. Um, a lot of effort on um, large domain parameter estimation, um, model benchmarking, network routing, etc. And um, a lot of this now has been um, uh, been applied over the North American domain and um, beginning to be applied over the global domain. Um, we can make um, we can make animations like this, and you know these are these are somewhat interesting. Um, but um, the main things that we're interested in is um, is the science behind the products. Um, so we're interested in um, how can we improve the inputs to hydrological models. Um, how can we improve the um, representation of physical processes. Um, um, how can we improve the way that we um, that we route stream flow over the landscape? How can we improve the way that we represent lakes? Um, how can we improve the um, statistical reliability of our stream flow forecasts? Um, how 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 can we improve um, um, how we um, understand the impacts of climate change on border resources, etc.? So uh, most of my work is in computational hydrology, which you could view as the science behind the maps and the the work that we're trying to do to. Um, to improve the fidelity of our hydrological model simulations. Um, it's a wicked interdisciplinary problem. This is a, this is a figure um, that's describing the evolution of land models over the last several decades. Um, at the beginning of time, land models were really just a lower boundary condition to the atmosphere. That was their purpose, um, is to provide the lower boundary condition. Um, towards um, the late 90s, um, um, the focus was on really um, um, properties defining processes. So how could we um, prescribe the properties of the landscape and simulate processes at, um, at shorter temporal scales? And then as we're moving through time, we're beginning to add you know, more and more processes um, to the models. And, and the land surface models aren't called land surface models anymore. They're called land models um, because we're representing land as an integral component of the earth system. Um, where we need crops, irrigation, lateral flow, land cover change, um, um, explicit representations of the carbon cycle, groundwater, lakes, rivers, wetlands, etc. And in order to do this, we really need um, to pull together people, you know, from um, multiple disciplines and um, work together as a coherent team. Um, so I think that's, um, that's one of the key areas of this this workshop. Um, my interests here probably in three areas. I'm interested in seasonal water supply forecasting. So what I'm showing here is a couple of figures from um, Louise Arnal, um, who's been um, looking at um, case study of the Kootenay River at Fort Steele. It's in the Columbia River Basin. So um, there's a map of, uh, of the basin on the right. And um, she's um, beginning to produce um, ensemble stream flow forecasts um, for this basin. That's what's shown on the left there. And um, she's doing that um, for a number of basins across Canada so that we can understand regional variations and, and predictability. Um, for ag in the US, uh, where I've spent most of my career, seasonal water supply forecasting is a really, really, really important component. And it started with the development of the snow course network in the mountains in response to the 1930s bus, uh, dust bowl. Um, also interested in the climate sensitivity of agricultural systems and um, coupling of uh, ecological and hydrological models. Um, so similar to what um, Phil Harder was talking about. So in there, and then um, I, we're not having questions now, I understand, so I'll pass over, pass over to the next person. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Martin. Uh, I believe I'm the next person. So um, what is it giving me? Okay, it's telling me I don't. Hang on, sorry, I haven't. 
Um, apparently, uh, Palash, I'm not able to do this without quitting Zoom. So I'm going to kick this old school. And you guys are just gonna listen to me. Can you still see me? Yeah, you can see me? Yes, we can see you. All right, so I'm gonna look at my slides and they're gonna look great. And you guys are just gonna listen to me talk because uh, we just don't well, have Do time. you want to send it to me? I can then. Sure, I'll do that. And then you can, uh, and so while I'm talking, while I'm sending that, I will just get started. And so uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm, uh, I'm Angela bedard Hahn. I'm the, the Dean of uh, Ag Bio and a soil scientist. Importantly, I'm a soil scientist. So my background, actually I started off in physical geography, which I think is a great place for anyone to, to get started and uh, gained my appreciation for landscapes and landscape variability there. And then made my move over to soil science uh, where I have very much um, uh, enjoyed my career and so um, in addition to my, uh, my roles within the college, I'm also part of the, um, uh, part of the Global Institute for uh, Water Security. And uh, I am a, an associate member of SENS as well. And so I'm, uh, I'm perhaps not entirely conventional in that. Uh, and I, I do keep my, uh, put, put my uh, feet in multiple ponds, so to speak. And so in terms of my areas of focus, um, it's, I really focus on what I refer to as applied pedology. So how soil properties inform management practices for agronomic and environmental benefit. And a lot of that the focus within that context has been within the prairie pothole region and focusing on wetland soils. And so in terms of what's in my, uh, what's in my toolbox, what tools do I like to use? Uh, really, a lot of it is framed around an understanding of soil variability. And so if we look at, um, so if you just want to skip ahead to the toolbox one, Palash, that'd be great. Uh, so it's understanding of soil variability. So how soils vary horizontally and vertically across the landscape, and then how that affects the types and intensities of soil properties and processes. And so in uh, looking at that, at that uh, spatial variability, um, what does that mean for uh, when we're when, you know we look at the, the previous presentations? What does that mean in terms of our in terms of our modeling? And so that context that soils are, are non-uniform in terms of their their uh, their horizontal and vertical uh, function is really the underpinning of everything that I do. I, I, it would be <laughs> highly un, unusual for me to look at in, uh, at soils in any other context. So I complement this with biogeochemical analyses of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus dynamics. These are some of the, in addition to being key macronutrients, these are also um, nutrients that tend to be highly landscape dependent. And then uh, over time, I realized that in order to be able to actually scale up the work that I was doing, I needed to do a better job of um, understanding, of, of mathematically moving this, uh, this very, understanding this variability across the landscape and being able to scale it up to the watershed scale, to the regional scale. And this led me a, a bit more deeply into predictive soil mapping techniques. And I had done little bits of this uh, uh, as part of my, um, <laughs> uh, sorry, Palash. Uh, I've done little bits of this as part of my, as part of my masters. And then, so to get, um, uh, to get back into the, uh, sorry, go back one, please. I started getting into the predictive soil mapping. So we're integrating legacy soil survey information. So that's the information you would get if you looked at a traditional soil survey, integrating that with environmental covariates. And a lot of these really link back to some of the hydrological modeling that we've heard about from, uh, from Martin and also from Philip, and then using machine learning algorithms, things like random forest to try, uh, uh, to try and predict the distribution of points across the uh, soil properties across the landscape. Next slide, please. So in terms of what my group has been up to, it's looked at a whole range of uh, integrated uh, questions. And so looking at how wetlands, so from really from, from the biogeochemical perspective, looking at how wetland drainage affects soil properties, uh, how riparian management affects soil properties, hydrology and salinity, 
I've got a new PhD student just started this fall who will be looking specifically at questions around carbon storage and accounting and uh, 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 stock change factors, how those vary across the region and among different wetland types. And all of this is complemented by the, the soil information work that we do. And so I, my team developed the Saskatchewan Soil Information System, which is an approach for uh, accessing the existing soil information, but we also have work underway to try and really capture the, very, uh, the spatial um, uh, refinement of soil information. So taking soil information from the, the relatively coarse scale, most of our soil information in Saskatchewan is at a scale of one to 100,000 and getting it down to like one to 10,000 or better because that's the scale at which some of these, most of these uh, processes are actually uh, relevant and functioning. And so really that last point is how can our hydrological information and this is really reflected in our soil properties, the kinds of properties that, you know, when I dig a pit that I'm looking at, how does that, how can that information then be used to inform management decisions? So, you know, going back to, to what Philip said about precision agriculture, if we can learn from the soil and this, this non-uniform distribution of soil properties and processes across the landscape, can we integrate that with some of the land modeling that Martin was talking about uh, and ultimately come up with much, much better, uh, more sophisticated approaches to precision management. Next slide. And so this is just an example of some of this predictive mapping that we're talking about here. So if we look at the, the, the air photo on the left, this would be kind of what, the, what you would, it would look like from above, classic. The top right would be the legacy soil survey. So that same area, this is kind of the scale of information that we're typically mapped at. And so, those of us that are, are used to looking at air photos are going, oh, like that one on the right completely misses most of the variability and certainly the way the water would move across the landscape. And it's captured in map units that, you know, say oh, there's 70% this, 15% that. The bottom part takes uh, LIDAR and, and, um, and some of these techniques we were talking about and then really disaggregates that into its finer categories. So you can see how this bottom right picture uh, would provide way more information if you're actually wanting to do precision management than the one on the top right. So the last point here is just around the big question, you know, recognizing that soil is not an inert medium, how can we better incorporate our understanding of soil variability into our management, but also into our models and our policy? And so with that, I will stop and we can turn it over to the next person. I'm in. Are you ready? You're muted, so make sure you unmute before you start. So can you see my screen now? Yes. Go ahead. All right. So uh, my name is Amin Shibagi. I'm from the Department of Civil, uh, Geological and uh, Environmental Engineering. Um, and I, uh, so I'm, I'm in general a professor of water resources engineering. I would put my work under the general title of performance and sustainability assessment. This can be of natural systems, engineered systems, or hybrid that include both of them. Uh, and I do this mainly through, through modeling. So I do uh, modeling and I'm a person that you would typically call the, the systems guy. So I do uh, systems modeling, water resources systems, watershed hydrology as a system. And over the past four years, I, uh, I put a lot of emphasis on the water energy food uh, nexus. So uh, what tools or methods I'm, I'm using when we do watershed hydrology on floods and stuff like this, I use some of the typical existing tools and software like mesh and SWAT and uh, uh, HBV and so on. But uh, a lot of our work has been focused on the prairies and for that we needed to uh, develop our own tools or modify existing tools. We developed watershed model called Hyper and then Mesh Prima and uh, some topographic based methods for flood mapping and so on. And we do a lot of stochastic uh, analysis for that. Uh, more importantly in our water resources management and the web or water energy food nexus models, we, we build our own uh, models in, in system dynamics to be able to uh, combine different uh, uh, models and different dimensions uh, of the problems, the human aspects, the, uh, uh, the water aspects and so on. 
uh, and I, in the past, I have done several years of, uh, of machine learning uh, work. So uh, what I have done that I feel it's relevant to what we are talking about today is uh, I, I did several years of research with the oil sands in, in northern Alberta, uh, developing models for their uh, reclamation uh, covers for rec the reclaimed watersheds, uh, try to assess the uh, moisture availability uh, and project how the vegetation and the forest will grow uh, in the future under different scenarios of climate change and so on. Uh, but we uh, worked a lot with the integrated water resources management in, in Saskatchewan. We uh, developed systems model to look into trade-offs between uh, hydropower generation, irrigation, environmental flow, uh, and so on. And we looked at how the province uh, as a whole might gain or lose from certain scenarios of some of these trade-offs and, and synergies. Uh, and for that, we developed some uh, probabilistic and risk-based framework to assess uh, such uh, trade-offs. Over the past four years, the main focus uh, has been uh, on uh, really developing the water energy food nexus literally, uh, but the scale I work on is really a larger scale. So uh, we, have, we, we have been focusing on Saskatchewan as a province to try to, uh, I'm trying to get here um, a pointer. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we, we try to put the agricultural crop production system and the energy production and consumption system and the water resources system and identify and quantify the feedbacks and the connections uh, between, between these uh, systems. And we were able to develop a, a, a decent modeling system that we called WebSask. Uh, so it, it has enough information that we were able to model uh, rain-fed and uh, irrigated agriculture to try to reproduce the crop yield, the annual crop yield of the 12 major crops in Saskatchewan. We were able to calibrate and validate the model nicely for 12 crops, including wheat, canola, and so on. Uh, we are, we are uh, reasonably confident that this can uh, reproduce the crop uh, yield under different moisture and nutrient application uh, conditions. But more importantly, because this is a nexus, we try to connect really this issue to all other aspects of water and energy uh, in the province. This is a small, small figure, but if I focus a little bit, so we can look into the effect of different climatic and socioeconomic factors on issues like food production, like greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So just as a quick example here, uh, based on our model findings, we, we would say that Saskatchewan crop production can benefit from a slightly cooler summers. You can see the crop yield can increase with a little bit cooler uh, temperature in the summer here, but any, any more cooler than that or, or in hotter summer, then there will be some crop yield reduction unless we change cultivars, unless we change uh, the breedings that will have uh, perhaps higher growing degree days uh, requirements. Uh, so, uh, uh, what, we, what, what I'm doing that this is Saskatchewan is, is really water energy food nexus with a lot of emphasis on the food as well. But in other places like our applications to, for example, case study in Egypt, the, the focus is mainly on water and food and we connect that to trade, how the export and import of, of the food in a country like Egypt will be uh, affected by the nexus, by the water use and the, and the land use. Uh, and we were able, for example, to connect, uh, let's say four main objectives, what will happen in, in gross margin in agriculture, what will happen to the food import and the cost of that, what will happen to the water use within the country, and how can we develop different cropping pattern that can be robust under various future conditions. So starting from modeling the crop yield, uh, uh, at the national scale up to how this is affecting the socioeconomics uh, of the country. And we really work on national or provincial scale. So we don't do the nexus on watershed scale, but on administrative uh, jurisdictions. Uh, what I would like to see really uh, happening here is to expand our WEF uh, SASC model into more of a nexus assessment framework that uh, we would call the WEF-NAF. 
Uh, and we want to uh, see how these things would be working under different climate and policy conditions and try to develop some robust pathways for the uh, future. We want to expand to the prairie as a region. We want to connect to something like GCAM, a global integrated assessment model to see how uh, can uh, these global models benefit from some feedback from more detailed local uh, and regional uh, models. Uh, if I have one, what I would call big question for the group to think about after all these great ideas we heard, is it possible to establish some sort of a strategic research unit that's really focusing on this important nexus issue that, that can connect really GIFs and the Global Institute of Water Security and operationalize all these dreams and ideas that we heard about. Thanks a lot. Great, thanks very much, Amin. So while uh, Barry's getting his presentation loaded, I just want to say this is you know this is why people think scientists are uh, speaking a different language because they, they come to a seminar and they'd be like WEFNAF. What is a WEFNAF, right? But I think that's a fantastic acronym, and I'll probably remember it forever. <laughs> WEFNAF. All right. So um, Barry, are you able to share your screen? It's not letting me right now. So someone else is. Uh... Perfect. You have the same system that's like me, that's too secure to, for its own good, probably. <laughs> Barry, you should be able to now. Okay, I'll give it another shot here. We need some thinking music in the background, but no, it's not letting me... Uh... Hang on here. When we hear Palash's voice, it just kind of reminds me of the voice of God. It just kind of comes in there and <laughs> takes control. Okay. Don't let that go to his head, Jay. <laughs> Barry, do you want to send it to me? You know, I might have to do that. Um, did we want do you want to, to go to the last? You want to go to the last speaker, and I will. I will send it to uh, to Palash, and uh, and then we will uh, we'll go from there. If you if you don't mind, sorry about that. No worries. I had the same problem. Pat, are you okay. able to share Thank your screen you. and jump in here? Or maybe Pat took this moment to step away. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I took this moment to keep myself muted. All right. Perfect. Away you go. That looking good? All right. Um, my name is Pat Lloyd Smith. I'm an assistant professor in the Agriculture and Resource Economics Department, as well as a member of the Global Institute for Water Security. Uh, I'm a water and resource economist by training. Um, and some of the things I'm interested in. So I'm really interested in human behavior and using human decisions to understand what uh, people's preferences are, as well as their values for different environmental resources, water in particular. And I'm interested in the implications of these decisions on the environment, on the economy, but as well as on human well-being altogether. So here's my sort of conceptual map it's a bit more simplistic than a means. I, I noted, so I was feeling a little uh, sheepish pulling it out after a means. But um, really, at the heart of this is human behavior and decisions, and I think that's sort of where my sort of uh, interests are and my sort of skill set is uh, when we talk about agriculture and water, in particular about uh, agricultural producers, and so understanding sort of these farm level decisions that agricultural producers are taking. Um, what tools, methods am I using these days? We want to understand people, we got to go out and talk to them. So I do a lot of producer and consumer surveys, um, in person, online, um, just to help understand and help them in the modeling decision. For kind of quantitative methods, I do a lot of choice modeling. So really analyzing these decisions. Um, as I mentioned, I do some farm level decision models, as well as I have a big interest in non-market valuation. And that is essentially trying to understand the economic value of goods and services, ecosystem services that aren't necessarily part of our formal economy. So they don't have prices, but they still have value. How can we understand that? So I employ various non-market valuation techniques. Uh, I've also done some behavioral experiments. Again, you wanna analyze humans, putting them in the lab and poking them in prodnum with different uh, experiments is one way to do it. Um, as well as just some good old fashioned economic analyses of project policies, benefit cost analysis, economic impact analysis. 
So a few of those other sort of tools there. What, uh, what am I doing in the food water area? Well, sort of three areas of research. Um, first off, looking at water as an economic input into agriculture. So this is really trying to understand what's the value of water to agricultural production, as well as how does water, water scarcity, um, is that a driver of different crop choices that producers make, the decision to irrigate or not, or be part of an irrigation district? Um, so this is really sort of focused on water quantity issues and water scarcity issues, and that relationship sort of as an input into agriculture. Second area is looking at sort of the outputs of water from the agricultural system. And so all these externalities, how can we understand, met, quantify them, and uh, where appropriate actually value these different externalities. So these questions are, are around sort of what are sort of some of the social costs of water pollution. Um, agricultural production is one of the leading sources of water pollution, especially here on the prairies. And how can we understand sort of what those costs are? How can we use those costs to inform um, different agri-environmental policies? So the provincial governments across the prairies are spending a lot of money on different BMPs, different agro-environmental policies, and they really don't have a great understanding of what society is gaining from these policies. So if we can measure these externalities, we might be able to use that information to help design better uh, agro-environmental policies. And then the third area, uh, it relates to wetlands and wetland conservation. Um, it's a big sort of topic and area of interface for water and ag production here on the prairies because we have so much dry land agriculture. So we don't have as much irrigation of other places. And so there's a lot of issues around um, um, downstream costs of wetland drainage or agricultural water manage management overall. And I'm interested in sort of helping to understand sort of what does it cost to act like the opportunity cost of actually having wetlands on the landscape and then working uh, with natural scientists to understand what are the sort of ecosystem services provided by wetlands and ultimately those economic values. So we can do some benefit cost analyses of different wetland conservation projects. What would I uh, like to see in the food water area? Well, just going back to that earlier diagram I had, um, I have some expertise on some of these squares, some of these arrows, but there's a big uh, room for interdisciplinary scholarship here. And I'm really interested in sort of how we can use all the understandings that we have across our two institutes to help better inform policy. Um, so I'll kind of leave it there um, for myself. Excellent. Thanks very much, Pat. And over to Barry. So while we're bringing up Barry's presentation, if any of you have a hard stop at two o'clock, do be sure to send your questions on to the speakers directly or to send any follow-up comments to, uh, uh, to the organizers as well. Barry, you ready to roll? I think so. Um, if Palasha, I sent the, sent the talk. And because I'm on a government computer, I actually have to leave the meeting and come back and uh, couldn't get back in. So I had to phone Palasha and he let me in. And here we are right now. So. <laughs> Glad it's the last talk. <laughs> so, uh, Clash, can you get uh, get the talk up there? Anyway, while we're doing that, uh, my name is Barry Bonzel, and uh, I'm actually a Fed. I'm with Environment and Climate Change Canada, and located uh, at uh, the National Hydrology Research Centre, an innovation place. Uh, and if you just go to the next slide, a little bit more on who I am. And uh, being born in Saskatchewan, you have to be an avid curler. So I am an avid curler, but uh, found out that uh, growing up that this wasn't gonna pay the bills. So in the mid to late eighties, I uh, went to the University of Saskatchewan and, and majored in physical geography that we just heard about there. And uh, as time went on in the late 80s, we, uh, if you, some of you might remember in Saskatchewan, we went through some uh, pretty severe droughts, especially in 88. And it, and it piqued my interest on, on what's causing these droughts and uh, did my master's uh, looking at the, at the uh, causes of, of major droughts in Western Canada and looking at sea surface temperatures and uh, a relatively new field, which was called teleconnections. So looking at things like El Nino Southern Oscillation, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and found some interesting relationships. 
and uh, got my PhD in the mid 90s and then was off to Toronto for five years and did my postdoc there and a little stint with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Then was lucky enough to get back to Saskatoon in 2001 and I was uh, hired as a research scientist, especially in, in hydroclimatology. And uh, we've gone through a few name changes there, but uh, right now we're the Watershed Hydrology and Ecology Research Division. And um, that's uh, within the Water and Science Technology Directorate uh, with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Also an adjunct professor in the Department of Geography and Planning at the University of Saskatchewan and the Department of Geography at the University of Manitoba. So next slide, please. So, what have we done? And I want to say we here because it's a group of us that's working in that watershed hydrology and ecology research division. And we have scientists in Saskatoon, in Burlington, Ontario, and Victoria. And really what we're working on is looking at freshwater availability across Canada. So mostly past and future climate impacts on the freshwater resources across Canada. So, so we're looking at very big scales, looking at larger scales. There's been a lot of talk about scales earlier today. And a particular focus, and again, this stems a little bit from, from my graduate work that I was talking about uh, earlier, is looking at the hydroclimatic extremes, such as droughts and floods, and some of the associated atmospheric circulation patterns uh, that, that I also talked about there. So one of the things that recently came out uh, from our group uh, and Environment and Climate Change Canada in, in general is Canada's Changing Climate Report that was released uh, April of 2019. That's uh, first really, uh, large-scale assessment on, on, on Canada's changing climate, past changes and, and future changes. And for the first time, there was a dedicated uh, in-depth chapter on, on changes in freshwater availability across Canada that I was lucky enough to, to lead, and that's uh, included in this assessment. So that's some of the things we've been working on, and again, uh, more on the extremes, droughts, and floods. Uh, next slide, please. So what are we doing? Uh, again, we're continuing this work. We're looking more at you know, climate change and freshwater. Uh, where, where are our freshwater resources going to be in the future? Just finished a major study looking at Western Canadian freshwater availability, uh, current and future vulnerabilities. So if you look at the map on the right-hand side there, we looked at uh, a, a series of, of major basins that flowed off the, the Western Cordillera in a north, west, and, and east flowing directions and looked at the sub basins and tried to do a major assessment of water supply indicators, several water supply indicators, and where information was available, water demand indicators. And the paper has just been accepted in, in environmental research and uh, trying to look at the freshwater vulnerabilities in Western Canada where we get a lot of the water coming off the uh, hydrologic apex of the country. And we're also uh, you know, still working on the impacts of these hydroclimatic extreme events of, of droughts and floods. So next slide. What tools and methods? Uh, essentially we're using uh, information that's out there. So it's existing observations, some reanalysis products, and a lot of model data, climate and hydrologic model data. And uh, a lot of it is available on, on an Environment and Climate Change Canada portal called the Canadian Centre for Climate Services. You can find station data there. You can find some gridded uh, products, historical observations of temperature and precipitation. And a lot of the global climate model output uh, is available at that site too. Uh, in our group, we use various hydrologic models, but we do a lot of collaborations. So we get a lot of information and, and work with others. Uh, yeah, and that's a lot of the methods we use. And for the food water nexus, again, we're, we're doing continued research on this climate change impacts on, on future freshwater availability, focusing on both supply and demand. And just started a four year project with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and it's entitled Sustainable Crop Production in Canada Under Climate Change. And essentially one of the main objectives is, is to look at new knowledge of climate extremes and water availability. And this is where our group comes in for sustainable crop production in Canada under climate change. So, you know, we're gonna see warming temperatures, maybe other areas where we can grow crops and, and there might be enough uh, heat degree days and, and units to do it, but without enough water, uh, you really can't go too much forward. So that's what we're collaborating with Agriculture Canada uh, to, to look at some of these aspects. And the final slide, just as we hit two o'clock here. One big question for the group. And, and again, if we look in the future and we look at a large scale, there's always gonna be some fresh water in Canada. We're not, we're not gonna turn into a great big desert or anything like that. The problem, the way the research is showing is that 
it's not going to be in the places where it used to be and at the same time of the year where it used to be. So, so the question is, you know, where and when, and maybe even how do we transfer the water from areas of surplus to areas of deficit in the future? And we think about this on a, on a larger scale. And I will end it in there and thank you much, uh, very much for your attention. Excellent, thanks very much, Barry. All right, so we do have, um, my understanding is that uh, for most of these sessions, we've allowed a few extra minutes afterwards for, for some discussion. So if folks want to go ahead and uh, turn on their screens and, and have some discussion. If you have uh, questions for any of the speakers, uh, you can go ahead and ask those, uh, ask those now. Um, I will open up. Yeah, Angela, we've been taking another 10 or 15 minutes, sort of depending on how much, how energetic people are. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I'll just start off by saying I thought that was another great session and really um, sort of wove together a lot of, um, you know, starting with the small scale drone stuff, um, seeing some of the modeling that's happening, seeing with Martin's talk how it can be done at a large scale, um, you know, Barry's talk about, uh, uh, external forcing and how, how climate and climate variability is playing a role. Uh, Pat's talk about how um, um, we can start looking beyond water, looking at uh, uh, larger scale economics um, and including externalities. Uh, so overall, a, a, a great, great session. Excellent. So does anyone have any questions off the top for any of the speakers? Oh, I just shot Barry a question. It was why the heck haven't we spoken yet? Um, given all the stuff that he does, I think it's uh, super important. And, um, um, you know, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder uh, well, let's just put it this way. When you move to a new place, it's tough to get to know everybody, but it's embarrassing when they're in your own building and you don't know them. So uh, look, looking I forward that, to that's, it. That's a lot my fault too. I'm, I'm kind of tucked away in a corner. We've been doing stuff like that, but th this is a, a great opportunity and, and, and I'm, I'm really excited to, to, to meet other people here and actually talk, <laughs> talk to you. I've seen you send hi a couple of times in the building before we had to close down there. But uh, I think we have a lot in common and there's a lot of things that we can do forward uh, moving forward. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. And the, of course the water availability part is such a big part of uh, the food, uh, food production. So very cool to see that you have that grant with AAFC and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, well, well, we'll, we'll have some follow on conversations for sure, but I just want to, uh, I'll keep talking if no one else talks, but I'd like to be quiet now to allow time for other people to talk. I wouldn't mind, Philip, if you're willing to, to comment a little bit on some of your, your early experiences with the, with the, um, uh, your new gamma system in terms of, you know, have you had a chance to play around with it much yet? And, and if so, what are some of the early indicators you have in terms of what's, what its potential is? Oh, well, it's, it's still, it's very much early days. Uh, I think we like took delivery of it in this last month, um, but have had it out, um, flying out at Clavette. Uh, and there's, there's lots to learn with it, especially in like the, the minutia of the technical details um, and the processing of the data. But you know, at this point, what I'd be confident saying is that there's more signal than noise. <laughs> you know, like we're, we, we, their patterns appear. Um, and a big part of it is um, there needs to be a lot of ground sampling, a lot of in situ field work to go with this um, to come up because it's essentially you, you're, you're going to be developing empirical models between your counts and, and, and variables on the ground. Um, so it's going to be a fairly intensive thing, but the problem is with COVID, you can't do these intensive field campaigns um, or in the winter. Um, so like we've, I've, I've got a couple of flights under my belt with it now, and we're going to examine snow water equivalent, see what we can pull out with that. Um, but yeah, like it, 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 and theoretically, it should be able to give us indications of soil moisture down to 40 centimeters. Potentially. Yeah, that would be pretty awesome, Philip. And so um, when you're ready to start doing those kind of field campaigns, I think we could probably get together 
uh, a pretty good crew of, of people that are that are interested in helping organize a, a, a campaign. I mean, I'm sure uh, Warren and and Andrew and and uh, Sarah and uh, Aaron Berg, who's at who's at Guelph. Um, you know, there's a there's a, a pretty significant soil moisture uh, community around, as you as you know. And I think uh, the gamma stuff would be really uh, Drone scale gamma stuff, I think would be pretty cool. And Angela, I think it really also points to like really knowing the soils like quite well. <laughs> yeah, well it is, it is a tool that works really well with, it, it com it's commonly used in a lot of the predictive mapping as one of the environmental covariate layers. And so I was I was really keen to, to hear more about about how it, some of your early experiences with it. And I would absolutely, you know, and I see Bing, Bing nodding there as well, I think, you know, uh, we and Quabi, yeah, you know, I think we would we would be really keen to be involved in that and exploring that with you and, and looking at what we could do to, to to make sure we're bringing every little bit of information out of that out of those flights. So let's make sure that we're all staying connected on that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And yeah, well, it's something we'll we lots lot, there's there's so many avenues to go when you start looking at nuclei's apparently. <laughs> I would just comment that um, if you are going to be pulling soil, it would be really great if we could connect first. Having a soil microbiologist on your team, it turns out, changes soil sampling into a giant pain in the neck. But um, mm. I definitely have hands that I can send <laughs> out and, and make all that aseptic fun stuff happen. So um, yeah, let's keep that in mind. For sure. Yeah, yeah mm. so the... Uh, um, we had some experience with uh, Cosmo. So mm -hmm. the uh, sampling depth is only max 14 centimeters. So if you can go 40 centimeters and we have a better handle of the zoom, root zone soil moisture, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's always the theoretical, what they promise and then reality um, and there's going to probably be some hard, uh, hard lessons there yet. Um, but right now we're going to go with the theoretical. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> theoretically, theoretically, it's going to work great. Well, yeah. so Philip, you know, that's the, the topic of the CFI that I wrote was, was mm -hmm. for, uh, uh, P-band radar, which is mm -hmm. if you're going to go aircraft or, if, well, I don't know if we could do it on a satellite, but aircraft, yeah, that's, that's the way to go. So that would get you that next, next scale. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the likelihood of getting that thing funded is, but if we get it rejected and want to do another round, we should, uh, you know, include the gamma stuff, you know, include this sort of multi-scale perspective of what we can do and, and how we can, uh, you know, what do you need to do to take it to a bigger scale, which would be prairie scale, prairie mm -hmm. scale mapping. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, no. Is Amin, Amin, are you still on? I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your integrated modeling. Oh, and, he had to step away. He'll be back at three, he said. So he had to. Okay, to I'll save it. Although, who knows how much time, you know, what direction that, that conversation will uh, will take. So Angela, another question then on the soil stuff. Like, so if we're going to look across the prairies, so your, uh, what is it, SSIS? Was it Saskatchewan? Saskatchewan. 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 Okay, so what resolution are we talking about? Like, how much information is there? And, and, I mean, I totally feel your pain about getting higher resolution and, you know, horizontally and, and greater depth. Yeah, so the existing information that is sort of what we call the legacy survey data is at the scale of one to 100,000. And so it's, you know, it's not capturing the variability that, that, that we would see at a management scale. Uh, but we do have some techniques now. If we have decent, you know, uh, you know uh, I mean, many of you have heard me bang on the LIDAR drum before. I mean, if we have decent um, uh, surface models, that it's relatively straightforward for us to at least disaggregate that information into the components of it. So it's maps, you, you, you know, a quarter section that you're doing land management at might include anywhere from three to six uh, soil types in that map unit, the way it's the way it was mapped based on the technology at the time. And so we have uh, we've combined a couple of different approaches that allow us to then 
what we say called disaggregate that polygon into its component pieces and distribute those where they belong across the landscape as long as we have a decent representation of the landscape and so you know, that's that's some of the work that we've been doing and so you know whether that's that information like philip helped us out with some of our early work just just getting a drone based uh um, uh, surface model at, at, at the at the field scale, actually on some of Jeff's uh, Jeff's land as well. <laughs> I see Philip and Jeff are right next to each other in my little Hollywood squares, and so <laughs> it's a, a, a chance for us to to kind of do the work that way. So, in terms of you know, and the reason it's important, even at you know, when I think about the, the the scale that you're at, right? When you look across the prairies. At a minimum, you want to be able to like this existing Saskatchewan soil information system would at least let you get at some of the broad swath kind of characteristics of, of, of uh, texture and um, you know, superficial geology controls on that. But when we start looking at things like you know, carbon distribution or nutrient movement across that, it's not you know it's it, it, it it's so much more complex than just moving it across that as, as a whole surface, right? That that variability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, are there ways of um, of increasing the spatial resolution short of actually going out there and, you know, digging soil pits like whatever, every 10 feet or something? Well, and that's that's really what what our group is doing. Right. So this disaggregation technique that we've that we've been working on, you know, the more you know, if you have point data that you can use for kind of uh, validating that great. But even just with a, a decent uh, LIDAR, right, like a decent uh, uh, surface model and the existing legacy data, we can actually do a not bad job of breaking the landscape down into its components, right? Because we know what we've got, so we can basically uh, uh, digitize the, the soil surveyor's conceptual model for how those soil, where those soils appear across the landscape. So right. I can look at my soils colleagues and go, yeah, we know what a, a catena, like how the soils are normally distributed across the landscape. And we can train the computer to, to take that, that polygon right. of soil information. And it says, okay, you're telling me it's got these soils in it. And we've got these environmental covariates that we can drive from the LIDAR and, and break that out into its pieces. And so that's, that's yeah. what we're doing. So, that, I mean, that's super important. So we have to, you know, anytime you use remote sensing, but you want to apply your stuff, right, at smaller scales, you have to do the disaggregation problem. And I think Sarah is not on the, uh, not on anymore, but she's actively working on that. So we'll, we'll loop back and connect with you or, or your group well, and I talk about. I'm here. Oh, you're there. Oh, Sarah's yeah. there. Oh, all right. It was funny. She's yeah. right above you in mine, and she's like, "I'm right here." <laughs> so I, have, I have a different. I have a different grid than you do. I don't have the same mapping that, that you do. I I scrolled through and I didn't see Sarah. But anyway, yeah. So Sarah, I mean, Angela's doing right. This high resolution, you know, has some methods, and and we're actively thinking about new methods for disaggregation, and so we should talk about it and combine combine yeah, forces yeah, and be very cool. Yeah. Yeah, and Sarah, yeah, I don't know if you're. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, Steve. Steve here. Like Angela, how like how good of res? You know, you know the trouble. The trouble with lidar is it's really expensive to get lidar surveys done, and there's hardly any done. Like like, what if you guys just use the existing DEMs that are available? Like you know the 20 meter, the 20 meter pixel ones. Is that you know you can get a you can get a you can get a reasonable landscape uh, map out of some of those. It's certainly better than just the old soil maps. So it just depends where it's the where the sort of data are sourced from. So we've played around with like the shuttle radar representation and uh, uh, one of the certainly the the ones where they took the existing topo maps and digitized that. That's total garbage because it basically just it, it 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 erases all of the natural landscape variability. Like all, all the the hummocks and hollows are gone. It just goes from high to low. And you can actually see the contours <laughs> in the in the in the uh, rasters. It's terrible, uh, but the the shuttle radar is okay. One of yeah. the challenges, though, is it is you are still losing some of that finer scale. So the, some of the shuttle radar stuff might work for the scale of some of Jay's stuff. If we're looking across the prairies, you're still going to lose some of the uh, some of the wetlands that might be important at a management scale, just due to you know where the how that lines up. Uh, but also, you know, with, on SRTM you're talking about? Yeah. Oh, okay. And so that one, it, it, at the scale of the most of some of the soil properties we're looking at, we do. It's okay. It's you know, it's it's certainly better than nothing. And then, uh, but certainly, some just even some of the drone-based stuff, um, uh, 
and not full-blown LIDAR, but some of the, the, the drone-based stuff that, that a lot of producers are collecting now, uh, even, you know, working in there with uh, Corey Wilness and, you know, a lot of that. And then you combine that with, uh, with some of the remote sensing imagery to help tease out or correct some of those features. And you can get a long way. So it depends if you're not using just entirely DEM, if you start bringing in, um, I'm just my name. My the name of it is the. the I think I think what you're trying to think of is if you, if you if you can pull in if you can pull in the RTK if you can pull in the RTK from the yeah. equipment as when it goes over it. Although there's gaps, you know, it has really good resolution in the in the line of travel. It has you know a lot of times if the if the equipment's 100 feet wide, it has those bigger swaths in between. But that's a really good data set that you can bring in. Yeah. Well, yeah. I also thought it'd be great yeah, to that's exactly about, right. I, I, also, it would be great to send Philip out going quarter section by quarter section across all of Saskatchewan yeah. to map topography. Yeah, well, that, that, that was my first thought, Jay, is actually we would just yeah. get... We, we, we can do section by section now. Okay, yeah, section by section. All right. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, 42 million right. acres won't take long. <laughs> Yeah, so Steve, that's exactly the kind of work when we're talking about uh, some of the integrated mapping approaches we're interested in, where we look at uh, using whatever information the producers can provide us with within their quarter section or across their land, and then using that as, as environmental covariates. So it might vary, like this farmer might have RTK, that one we might just be working with shuttle radar, it'll vary the, the outputs that we can give them. But all of that information, we're looking at ways we can use the environmental covariates that are available to us to disaggregate at the at the management scale. Yeah, there's a there's a lot there's a lot of data out there. It's just kind of put getting it in a form you can use and getting it. Yeah. So, um, what, so maybe what, oh, go ahead, Bing. I was going to yeah, suggest. Us, that, yeah, ahead. I'm just thinking how popular the RTK in among Saskatchewan farmers. Can we? Do we have really the ability to stitch all different farms together with this? There's probably over data. over probably over half of the acres are 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 have a machine with one of the machines that goes over it has RTK way over half. You think that high, Steve? I don't know. I would say so. Uh, yeah. Like Auto Steer even has RTK. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's not RTK. It's one level below RTK. That's that's, that's still it's still yeah. I know it's RTX, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah. that's still that's still pretty. We've used that. We've 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 looked at the data from our our uh, like we use that on our plot RTX, and it's it's only it's only one order. Of, it's only double the loss of resolution of RTK. So it's pretty darn good. It's a lot better than was. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that a bunch of new uh, new acronyms. Yeah, thank you for pointing out uh, WEFNAF. And I thought he was saying WETNAP at first. I, I'm a little confused. <laughs> it's part of what makes it so fun, Jay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, Jay, I have to run to another meeting, so I'll turn this discussion okay. over to you. And uh, well, I I, I think we should wrap fun. it up. Uh, yeah, I think we okay. Bye bye, Angela. Yeah, let's wrap it up, everybody. Take a break until uh, until one o'clock. Just a heads up, we're going to start off with a little uh, review of the Bangladesh uh, uh, activity. And Steve uh, Vischer is actually going to give it like another, you know, a five minute talk. And then we'll have like 10 minutes of discussion or so. And then we'll open it up to a broader discussion. But uh, another great session, everybody. Really, really uh, uh, enjoyed it. And we'll talk to you soon.